coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my son, whom I dearly love, and you I find happiness. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives, and trust the good news. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning we conclude our sermon series called Season of Change. We've been reflecting on the difficulties of making the changes that we want or know we need, and the inevitability and the challenges of change that happens in the world around us. Today I'd like us to think about how our relationship with Jesus leads us to be agents to help God's kingdom come on earth as in heaven, and how that commitment sometimes requires risk. The author of Mark's Gospel warns us about that risk right from the very beginning. The verses that we just heard from the opening of the Gospel essentially launch Jesus' ministry. They're the very first words that Jesus speaks in Mark's Gospel, and they serve as a kind of mission statement. Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. Jesus is announcing that through him, the future hope of God, God's reign of justice and equity, compassion and mercy, is breaking into the present. God's future promise is becoming a current reality. But to be part of that inbreaking kingdom requires a change of heart and life. Mark also lets us know right up front that some hearts and lives won't want to be changed. He notes that Jesus began his ministry after John the Baptist was arrested. Remember that John was the one who was preparing the way for Jesus. His message was the same as Jesus' message, that God's kingdom is coming, change your hearts and lives. And what happened to John? The powers that be, those that didn't want change, who didn't welcome the coming of that sort of kingdom, were arrested and killed. So right there, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we're given a clue that being an agent of God's change in the world can be risky business, that it can cause controversy, conflict, confrontation. That's a refrain that we'll hear throughout Jesus' ministry. He's in conflict with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the Herodians, even with his own disciples. Everywhere you turn in Mark's Gospel, you'll see Jesus at odds with those who want to maintain the status quo, with those persons and powers and systems that resist the change that the coming of God king, God's kingdom requires. I think that recurring theme is a clue for those of us who seek to follow Jesus that we're going to run into the same sort of problems. Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust the good news. Nearly 2,000 years later, those of us who would be followers of Jesus are still being called to trust the good news of the inbreaking of God's kingdom and change our hearts and lives so that we can be a part of God's transformation in the world. That might not seem like such a terrific invitation to some of us. I mean, sometimes I think we can get so overwhelmed by the thought of being God's transformation agents that we become paralyzed. The call to help establish God's future of a world ruled by justice and peace, love and compassion, seems like such an impossible task that we don't do the part that is possible for us to do. Those of you who have online access, internet access, may be familiar with TED videos. 
TED is a series of conferences that was established to share, as they put it, ideas worth spreading. Each year, an exceptionally innovative individual is chosen for the annual TED Prize, which consists of $100,000 and the chance to share one wish to change the world. Sharing these wishes with such a wide global audience often leads to the creation of new projects that have far-reaching impact. A few years ago, the winner was a French artist who calls himself J.R. In the video of his TED Prize speech, J.R. describes how he got a phone call explaining that he won the prize and telling him, you have to make a wish to save the world. Well, instantly he became anxious. He said, I was lost. I couldn't save the world. Nobody can. The world is messed up. Come on, you've got dictators ruling the world. The population is growing by the millions. There are no more fish in the sea. The North Pole is melting. And as the last TED Prize winner said, we're all becoming fat, except maybe the French. So I called back and I told her, look, Amy, tell the TED guys I just won't show up. I can't do anything to save the world. And she said, hey, JR, your wish isn't to save the world, but to change the world. Oh, okay. Perspective changed everything for JR, and he happily submitted his one wish to change the world. Our call, as those who've been transformed by our relationship with Jesus, is to change the world, not to save it. The entire responsibility for making the world into the reality that God intends and hopes for isn't all on us, thank God. We aren't responsible for saving the world, but we are charged with doing what we're able to change it in whatever way we can, great or small, to do whatever we have the power and the gifts and the abilities to do. We're called to help transform the way the world in small, incremental ways into God's desired future, into a a future free of injustice, oppression, inequity, or affliction. Sometimes that's a pretty safe proposition. I mean, do something good to make the world a better place. That's, That's pretty easy. But sometimes being God's change agents causes conflict and confrontation, like it did for John and eventually for Jesus. Living into God's future puts us at odds with the values and the culture around us. After all, if following Jesus and living a life of compassionate, other regarding, self giving, sacrificial love was countercultural in first century Judea, it's even more countercultural in 21st century America. And there are still hearts and lives, systems and powers that don't welcome change. So it's tempting just to mind our own business, practice our Christianity quietly, and avoid controversy or conflict altogether. I once helped facilitate a viewing of a documentary called Bully. The film is a no-holds-barred portrayal of the daily lives of victims of school bullying. The study guide that was written to accompany the film points out that the the determining factor in whether bullying is allowed to continue isn't the actions of the bully or of the victim, but the behavior of the spectators, whether they choose to remain bystanders or become what some call upstanders. Bystanders attempt to remain uninvolved by looking on silently or finding an excuse to walk away. Bystanders empower the bully by doing nothing. Upstanders challenge the bullying in some way through direct intervention or taking a stand beside the victim or seeking help from others some action that takes power away from the bully. Students who choose to be upstanders stop the injustice. I believe that if we're really and truly 
opening ourselves to being changed by our relationship with Jesus, then that changes us from being bystanders to being upstanders. It transforms us into those who are living into God's future of justice and compassion as though it's already here. It transforms us from being those who just as soon look the other way into those who dare to stand up to all that opposes what God desires for us, even if we do it with trembling voices and knocking knees. We're currently standing at a moment in time when more than ever we need to dare to be upstanders. In the last six weeks since the death of George Floyd under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer, an opportunity has presented itself to Americans to finally and honestly look and acknowledge prejudice, inequality, and injustice that people of color are subject to every single day. We're at a hinge point in our nation to finally and honestly acknowledge the existence of white, white supremacy and racism that is built into this culture, built into our institutions, built into our criminal justice system, often concealed enough to be unnoticed or denied, but very much a reality for those who are victimized by it. As followers of Jesus, whose ministry prioritized the oppressed, as people of faith who proclaim the sacred worth of all persons, as Christians called to seek equality and justice for those who are treated unjustly, we should be frontline upstanders. We should stand with our sisters and brothers of color, demand fairness, use whatever small power we have to change hearts and minds, systems and institutions. Truthfully, it's a whole lot easier to be bystanders, to merely sympathize and shake our heads and say, that is just not right, and leave it at that. It's easier to look the other way when somebody says something ignorant or bigoted, easier to avoid conflict, easier to hope somebody else will speak up, protest, intervene, advocate, legislate. It's easier to pray that God will do something about the situation than it is to offer ourselves up as part of the something God will. But couldn't we be at least a little more John and Jesus? Couldn't we be a part of God's work of transformation in the world to be upstanders, even in small ways, in spite of the risk, in spite of the discomfort? Being an upstander would look different for each of us. Maybe for you, it involves learning more about racism and white privilege and how to be an anti-racist. This fall, we'll have multiple learning opportunities here at the church. Maybe it's calling out people in conversations or on social media when they say or do something that's racist or racially insensitive. Maybe it's getting involved in the New England Annual Conference's Commission on Religion and Race or the Black Lives Matter movement. Maybe it's signing petitions or contacting those in power or financially supporting anti-racism organizations. Maybe it's teaching your kids how to recognize and reject racism. However it is you're feeling the tug of the Holy Spirit on you to be an upstander rather than a bystander, just do it. Remember what Desmond Tutu said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Now is the time, said Jesus. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives. Trust in this good news. If we've truly been transformed by Jesus, then we're compelled to be agents of transformation in the world for the sake of God's reign, for the sake of justice, equity, compassion, and mercy. We're compelled to do it even though there are times when helping God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven involves risk. Scripture reading is a reminder that Jesus' earthly ministry was one of proclaiming the inbreaking of God's kingdom, a ministry of calling people to their hearts and lives, a ministry of moving people 
from the way things are to the way God would have them be. Jesus' ministry was a ministry of change. He persisted in that ministry of change in spite of danger and opposition, despite the power and the people that resisted transformation, all the while trusting in the good news of God's reign. Jesus summons us to follow him, to change our hearts and lives so that we can be God's change agents in the world, however we can, with whatever power or ability or resources we have. Jesus calls us to continue his ministry of making God's future a current reality by becoming upstanders, those who dare to say no to injustice, oppression, and suffering, even when it's uncomfortable or intimidating. Jesus calls us to risk pushback and conflict for doing what's right and to continue our journey of change, trusting in the good news of God's reign, even when the going gets tough. Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. By the grace of God, may we indeed trust this good news so fully and so completely that we open our hearts and lives to be transformed by Jesus. May we have the courage to become God's means of transformation in the world, remembering that it's not our job to save the world, but it is our job to change it. And in doing so, may we boldly live into God's future of a world ruled by justice and peace, love and compassion. Amen.
As we come to our time of prayer, I wonder if there are joys or concerns that you would like to share, um, remembering that uh, we are live streaming, and so if it is something that is confidential uh, or that you just prefer not to share publicly, uh, you're welcome to speak to me after worship, and I will bring that to the um, prayer team on Tuesday evenings. We meet at 6.30 on You're welcome us for that time of prayer. Uh, you can find the Zoom link on our web page at the landing page amumc.org or you can find it uh, in the first post on our Facebook page. So um, let me share with you two uh, prayers that were um, given to me this morning. Uh, we mourn with Don Fox who lost his sister so we pray comfort for Don and for his family. We also uh, pray for uh, Sharon's friend Dee and her mom, who is living in an assisted living home in England after a health crisis in the fall last year. Uh, she was brought to England for um, treatment and uh, was placed in assisted living there. And in the meantime, the coronavirus pandemic broke out and her family is not able to um, go and, and bring her back. So she is at 90, 95 years old, is still in a care center in England, um, doesn't understand where her children are or why she's not at her home. And um, she has lost some cognitive uh, capacity since she has and so uh, we do pray for her. Her name is Jocelyn. And for her family as they worry about her and are forced to be separated. Are there any other prayers to share this morning? Sharon. Oh, okay. Okay, so my, my confusion. So Jocelyn is in England and uh, is able to, to see her. Right. And, and a joy that, um, that, all, that we're all here, but particularly um, it's good to see Betty again. It's been a long time of isolation. Are there others? Yeah. Uh, for my brother and his family, um, they live just outside of Houston. So oh. For Pam's brother and his family.